Allah revealed an ayah, They are stingy themselves, and now they're asking others to be stingy. On top of that, they hide the knowledge that Allah has blessed them with. Allah has prepared, prepared a humiliating punishment for them. We started studying this hadith two sessions ago. So today will be the third session on this hadith. So allow me to kind of refresh your memory. Hadith comes to us from Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an, from Al Adab al Mufrad of Imam Bukhari that we have been studying, chapter of good character and manners. Jabir radiallahu an says that the Prophet addressed my tribe of Banu Salima. And the Prophet asked them that, O oh, Banu Salima, man sayyidukum ya Bani Salima, who is the leader of your tribe? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, the leader of our tribe is Jad ibn Qais. Now, they introduced his name and then they immediately went on to say, Ya Rasulullah, he's our leader, but he's a little cheap. Inna nubakhiluhu. We considered him to be a bakhil. We considered him to be like a miserly person, tight fisted individual. So the Prophet, when he heard this, Immediately, he said something very shocking. He says, And what disease is worse than Bukhl? What disease, spiritual, ma uh, spiritual disease, is more detrimental than being cheapskate, being someone who holds back from spending when they should? And then the Prophet immediately changes their leadership ranks. He says, actually, your leader is Amr ibn al -Jamuh. So he changes the, the chain of command. And then the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he's done addressing the tribe. The narration goes on to say that Amr ibn al Jamuh was someone who used to be like the custodian of the idols. So he used to have an idol called Manaf and he would revere the idols. But then what happened because of the effort of his son Mu'adh and Mu'adh ibn Jabal the Great, two Mu'adh, they teamed up. And then, as the story I shared last time, they started throwing his idol in the ditch. And after a while, he had a light bulb moment. He realized, yo, yo, the idol can't protect itself. What is it going to do for me? So finally, he had that moment. Eventually, he accepted Islam. And he was, of course, very generous. He threw a walima on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ. Not on behalf of himself, on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ. So you guys, alhamdulillah, over the last few sessions, we've talked about some of the names that have come up in this hadith. Whether it's Jad ibn Qais, Amr ibn al-Jamur, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an. Today, we're going to get into the content of the hadith, and that is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu and what spiritual disease is more destructive than being stingy. You guys, the Arabic word is bukhl. The person who has bukhl is called bakhil. What exactly is stinginess? Linguistically, being stingy means as they say in Arabic, imsaqul hmali anil mustahiqi or an mustahiqi. Being stingy is to hold back from spending money from someone who's deserving of it. And then Imam Ghazali, he expands on this and he takes it to a whole new level. Beautiful, practical definition that all of us can kind of take it to the bank. Imam Ghazali says, I agree. Being stingy, being bakhil is when someone withholds money or withholds resources when it's obligated for you to spend. However, he says there are two types of obligations. The first is what he calls religious obligations. This is where you're religiously obligated to spend money. So if I were to quickly ask you guys, what are the religious obligations for spending money? Of course, number one on the list is? Zakah, very good. What's number two? Hmm? One other, is Zakah the only time Islam asks you to spend money? Are there any other uh, times where you're supposed to spend money? Number two is? Related to it is Sadaqatul Fitr. Number three, Udhiyah. If you are someone who can afford it, in the Hanafi school of thought, is wajib. What else, when else are you asked or obliged to spend money? You gotta pay the mahar if you wanna get married. And also, financial support that you're required to pay for your wife and your children. These are times where Islam asks you or obliges you to spend money. In these circumstances, where you're religiously obligated for you to hold back, you're definitely being a bakhi. And we know situations in our own community where someone promised mahar, it's been 20 years. You know, it's been a hot minute since that lady has seen any bit of that mahar that she was promised. And by the way, it's not just money, folks. Sometimes it's knowledge. If you have knowledge 
especially if you are someone who's a scholar and you can give a fatwa and you hoard religious knowledge, that is also something that falls in the category of bukhl. Sometimes it's your time and energy. A shocking hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, I shared this before, but just to remind you, the Prophet ﷺ says, Ali radiallahu anh reports, hadith comes in Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ says, Bakhil is the one in whose presence my name is mentioned and he does not send salawat upon me. That's a type of stinginess. Well, you could have taken a little bit of time and energy to send salawat in a way to appreciate the Prophet ﷺ, and you didn't. So, once again, let's go back to what Imam, Bukhari, uh, Imam Ghazali said. Being stingy, being bakhil is when you withhold resources in a situation where you're obligated to spend. But there are two types of obligations. Number one is a religious obligation. But he's like, that's not all. There's a second type of obligation, what he calls the cultural obligation, the conventional obligation. This is where your society has set certain norms. Of This is where your society has come up with what is known as a code of conduct polite, classy behavior. In those situations, a sane, noble, a person of noble character would spend, and this is where you're holding back. So it will be a good example. Well, in our society, there's an expectation, a norm that has been set for when you go to a wedding party, that you bring in a gift. Imagine you show up empty-handed, or you show, show up with the, I don't know, the, the most odd or the weirdest gift that does not belong in that situation. I don't know, you walk in with a bag of groceries or something like that. It would be weird. Or like imagine you're a surgeon making half a million dollars a year and uh, you write a check for 25 bucks. Like the convention and the norm for someone like you is to have at least three figures in that check. You know what I mean? So if you fall, if you're grossly off the norm that society has set for you, that is also something that would activate the title of stingy or being tight-fisted for you. Imam, Bukhari, uh, Imam Ghazali mentions another situation. He's like, imagine you're having food and your buddy pulls up in the parking lot or whatever and immediately you put the food in the to-go box and you hide it under the table so you don't have to share. Now, you're not religiously obligated to share food, right? It's not a wajib thing. Even though you're not religiously obligated, but culturally, you're a cheapskate. You are definitely miserly. Or you're that guy, he says, imagine the Qadi, the, Islam, the Muslim judge, he, in your case, had to intervene and tell you exactly the financial support you have to provide to your wife every month. Let's just say there was, I don't know, a lawsuit by your wife, the case ended up in the court, and the judge is like, you know what, <coughs> since, you, um, since you are that financially uh, thrifty, I'll just tell you exactly what amount to spend. Let's just say it's $3,000 a month. Now, once you give those $3,000, for every additional dollar, you fight tooth and nail, you want to see every receipt. Again, it's not a religious obligation, but you're in cultural violation of what is politeness and what is a classy person. You're that guy, your wife got organic eggs, and you're like, you know, you're going to throw a fit because why aren't you get farm eggs? You know, do I look like someone who's got a money tree growing in my backyard? This type of behavior is culturally Bakhil, even though you're not religiously Bakhil, although the religious Bakhil is worse. So, if you guys understood what stinginess is, once again, when you fall short of your religious obligation or your cultural obligation, if you understood this, now I like to bring your attention to what Quran and Sunnah have to say about a miserly person. The reward and the threats, the virtues and the vice. You guys, Quran brings up the concept of Bukhil roughly 10 times. And Quran, I wanted to kind of boil it down for you guys. Quran condemns three types of miserly behavior. The first type of condemnation that Quran issues, and this comes up multiple times. The first category that Allah condemns is when someone is being uh, stingy, when someone is hoarding, hoarding not money, but religious knowledge. Especially at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were people of the book who knew the Prophet ﷺ met all the signs of the final prophet that they were waiting for. He matched the prophecy and they could have communicated that and shared that with their people, but they didn't. Why? Because, yo, this rabbi, he doesn't want to lose his cred. He doesn't want to be someone who gets, who has to be re-accredited uh, re as an imam. Whatever the dunya they were afraid of losing, they remained silent. They didn't communicate to their people, this is the final prophet we've been waiting all along. They hoarded that religious knowledge. Allah says in the Quran, Inna ma min al min ba 
Allah Allah's lana is upon the people who hoard religious knowledge. Allah says, وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ يَبْخَلُونَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فضي. Let these rabbis and the priests know that they think hoarding and withholding this religious knowledge is somehow good for them. They have, they're, they're somehow able to maintain their prestige and their title. Oh no. بَلْ هُوَ شَرُّ اللَّهُ And you guys, you may think it was only the rabbis of the past that recognized the Prophet ﷺ because you know the Bible at that time may have still been more accurate than it is right now. SubhanAllah, recently I came across um, a YouTube channel, very famous YouTube channel. It's called Blogging Theology by Paul Williams. He's a scholar. He's a scholar of philosophy. He used to be a Christian, recently accepted Islam. He said that he was talking to a premier Christian scholar by the name of Keith Ward. He has written a lot of books. Keith Ward told Paul Williams that I have no problem believing that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the messenger of God. He's like, it's clear to me. So, Paul Williams, he's like, what about the upper echelons of Christian leadership? Do they feel the same way? He says, in the upper echelons, oh, Allah, my jaw draw, in the upper echelons of Christian leadership, they know and they recognize he's the final messenger of God. Sorry, he is the messenger of God. So, Paul's like, then why don't y'all believe? What does he say? They're like, yo, like, we got a tradition here. We got centuries of scholarship here. We got titles and letters after our names. We're not giving that up. Like, what's gonna happen to our institutions? We're too attached to our tradition to give it all up. And you know, my dear brothers and sisters, this doesn't just apply to the people of the book. I'm sure you guys have heard of this expression, scholars for dollars. A Muslim scholar who refuses to give a fatwa to condemn his religious, sorry, to condemn his government, refuses to call out his government who supports a genocide, why? Why is he silent? Why? Because he's on the government paycheck. The paycheck is cushy. The gig is cushy. The fancy homes and the luxurious cars, too much to give up. So silence is a bit more comfortable. And what happens? They're hoarding religious knowledge. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protects us from being in this category of someone who's religiously a bakhil, who's holding back knowledge from the masses. So that's the first type of miserliness Qur'an condemns. The other type of miserliness that Qur'an condemns is when there is a legitimate, dire religious or humanitarian cause on the ground. And people should step up because it's a dire necessity and people still hold back. So when the Prophet moved to Medina, Medina is under constant threat by the allies of Quraysh and Quraysh itself. The frontiers are not exactly secure. There needs to be manpower and financial resources. The army needs to be financed. And we have legitimate refugees coming into Medina. We need resources. And Ansar, of course, are very generous already, but there, you have people, hypocrites on the ground. You have Huyayy ibn Akhtab and the hostile Jewish tribes. They are not only holding back their financial resources, but they're going up to the Ansar and they're like, Ansar, are you crazy? You want to put all your financial resources in the... You want to put all your eggs in the Muhammad basket? Don't you want to diversify your risk and portfolio a little bit? You don't know how this is going to turn out. You don't know if Quraysh is going to win or he's going to win. Why are you putting everything behind this man? So Allah revealed an ayah. They are stingy themselves and now they're asking others to be stingy. On top of that, they hide the knowledge that Allah has blessed them with. Allah has prepared, prepared a humiliating punishment for them. My dear brothers and sisters, I worry because you and I are, in a, a, you and I are at a point in time where there is a genocide taking place. The other day, we were doing a fundraiser for baby formula for the children of Gaza. I hope to God all of us mustered up the courage to give at least something. Because this is as dire as it gets, as urgent as it gets, for still not contributing, for still not giving when we have a legitimate cause. I worry if we're gonna fall under this ayah that Allah is warning us about. I remember there was a fundraiser in Chicago when Dar es Salaam, the Dar es Salaam Seminary and Masjid was initially taking off. And in their initial fundraiser, the Sheikh was telling me 
who was responsible for organizing this fundraiser, he's like, I visited um, whoever I could, especially prominent members of the Muslim community who have a high net worth. These high net worth individuals, I visited them personally. Some of these people have an indoor tennis court, indoor pool, huge ceilings. You're looking at a home that's like 10,000 square footage. These types of individuals, I personally visited and invited them. When the fundraiser started, there were a couple different ways of investing. One scheme they came up with is that you can sponsor a prayer spot. So you guys are looking at a prayer spot, right? $1,800, you can pay over a year. Mufti Saab told me, there were people in that crowd who were making minimum wage. They stepped up and sponsored a prayer spot. And yet there were Muslims with multi-million dollar portfolios, indoor tennis courts, who could not muster, not muster $1,800. Legitimate religious cause. Why? What's holding you back? We need to look and x-ray uh, our finances to see how much is the outflow for God and how much outflow is going into our entertainment subscriptions, coffee, expensive lattes, eating out, steak house, houses. My dear brothers and sisters, when you have a legitimate humanitarian cause and we don't step up, and we can, you're not someone who's like, you're living off of zakah yourself. You are financially decently off and you don't step up, we may have a problem. And finally, the third, type of stinginess that Qur'an condemns is when people have religious obligations and they don't step up. They're not even paying zakah. I, wallahi, I'm telling you folks, this is something that I, turn, I need to turn into a khutbah. There are a lot of young people. They haven't paid zakah and they're 25 years old a single year of their life. They're not even aware. They pay taxes to Uncle Sam, they just don't pay zakah because I don't know if they're under the false pretense that they're dad is still paying their zakah as he's paying their credit card bill or whatever. I don't know what's going on there. They're not thinking about zakah. It's not even on their radar. It's a serious issue. Roughly, if you have $5,000 worth of savings and a year has passed on it, you got to pay zakah. And when you're calculating your savings, you're looking at your checking account, you're looking at your savings, you're looking at your gold and silver if you have that kind of assets. And you're also looking at your stocks. You're looking at your college fund. You pool all that up and if it exceeds Five to six thousand dollars, I can get you the exact rate, 88 grams of gold. Look up the exact uh, current rate for gold. If you are above that and a year passes on that, you gotta give zakah two and a half percent. You guys, there's an ayah in the Quran where Allah says, Wamin hum mana'a hadallah. Allah says, Amongst people are those who promise to Allah, La in atana min fadli. Ya Allah, if you enrich me, you give me from your bounty, la nasaddaqanna. We swear to you, we'll be the top donor. We will spend in your path. We'll be righteous. We'll be upfront in the front lines of lines of religious causes. Allah says, When Allah did enrich them, Allah, God hooked you up. What did they do? They held back. They turned away. In fact, they're in denial. And this is something, my dear brothers and sisters, that every single one of us need to need to be vigilant of in our own lives. That Allah, you were at a certain economic situation in your life and Allah enriched you. Imagine, like we know people who grew up in Pakistan, they're selling, they're selling chai in a little corner of the street and like they're like wiping windows of the car and this was the livelihood that they were making, sweating it out and then what happened? The visa worked out to America. And then what happened? Clinton just happened to pass a law which allows them to get on the green card track. And then what happens? They eventually become a citizen. And God bless them in their wealth. One gas station, second gas station. And next thing you know, they have a net worth approaching million dollars. And then Masajid approached them. And Madaris approached them. And they don't want to give. In fact, they're offended. Why are you coming after my money? This is my money. I made it. I'm a self-made man. And they're up. They're offended the fact, by the fact that the, that the Sheikh Ziyad is haggling them too much. You, you made dua to Allah, Ya Allah, enrich me, I'll be at the forefront of your causes. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to money. Generosity, or its opposite, miserliness, is not just limited to money, it's time too. I've had people who were too busy, uh, I've had people who were involved with this in ISM core, but then they had to step down because, well, they had to go to med school, or their job was just too demanding. And they're like, Brother Amir, as soon as my job stabilizes, I've been making dua to Allah, Ya Allah, give me a job that's stable nine to five. The moment it happens, I'll step right back in. 
So Allah gave them a job that's stable, predictable, similar income or higher, and now their evenings are completely free. What are they doing with those evenings? Netflix, binging on Hulu. That's how the evening is being spent. Where, what happened to that promise? My dear Akhi, Now, what's the scary part is, Allah says right after this ayah, This is scary. Allah says people who do this, they make a promise to Allah and then, then, and then completely turn their back. Allah says, their consequences that Allah puts nifaq in their heart. Hypocrisy is put in their heart. They will be now a people, religiously dry from the inside. Yeah, they're fronting. They got the religious garb, they're towing the line. But they will live this, this double life where the spirituality and sincerity they have it will be taken away from that. My dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet warned us against Bukhi. He said in a famous hadith that comes in Tirmidhi that As-Sakhiyu Qareebun min Allah Qareebun min al-Jannah Ba'eed So Qareebun min Allah Qareebun min al-Jannah Qareebun min Allah Qareebun min al-Jannah And then Ba'eedun min al-Nar The Prophet said a person who is generous he's close to Allah close to the hearts of the people away from the fire Vice versa, Bakhil is someone who's away from Allah, away from the people's heart because people don't like you when you're that cheap and you're always the taker and never the giver. And then, Qareebun min nar they're always at the cusp of hell because of their attitude and behavior. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anh, we don't have a lot of hadith from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anh. He rarely narrates, but we have this precious rare hadith from him where Abu Bakr radiallahu anh says, لا يدخلوا الجنة خب a person who's a con artist, a con man who swindles people out of their money, that person, and a bakhil and a mannan. Who's a mannan? Mannan is someone who does a favor to you and they keep reminding you. They keep milking it. They, they, <laughs> they will always rub it in your face. In fact, they will expect it now since you applied for their green card. And now they will always have you on the speed dial the moment they're moving. Or I don't know, they need to do a little paint job in their house. They're like, hey, where are you? They expect it. And the moment you say no, they're like, yeah, how quickly people forget. Mm, how people change. They're always ready to guilt trip you for not showing up. Manan, someone who's a con artist and someone who's a bakhil, Abu Bakr says that the Prophet says they will not enter paradise. I want to end today's session on a powerful story. Hadith comes in Bukhari and Muslim. Famous story, this is known as the story of the leper and the bald man and the blind man. So I'll end on this. Famous narration, if you've never heard of it, inshallah, you'll really enjoy this. So, the Prophet ﷺ said, from people before you, likely from the nation of Bani Israel, there used to be three individuals. A person who's a leper. Now, who's a leper? Leper is someone who has a skin condition where their skin is spotty all over their body. And they have this, uh, the skin looks like, it's kind of like looking at a gecko. They have this skin disease and of course for some people it's so bad it's almost dis you are disgusted just to look at it. So you have a leper and then you have someone who's bald and you have someone who's blind. Allah wanted to test all three of them. So فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكًا Allah sent an angel in the form of a person to test every single one of them. The angel first went to someone who is a bras, someone who's a leper. And we talked about who the leper is. And the angel says, Ayyu shay'in ahabbu ilayk. What is the most beloved thing to your heart? He's like, I want Allah to give me beautiful skin. And I, he wants, I, and I want Allah to give me a good color for my skin. He says, and this is mentioned in the hadith, he's like, people look at me and they're disgusted. They can't stand me. I've suffered a lot. The dear wish of my heart is that Allah gives me, you know, a fair skin and a, and a color to go with it. So the angel rubs his skin and this person is healed on the spot. And then the angel says, um, What is the most precious asset to you or wealth to you? What type of wealth would you like to own? This person says, Al-Ibl, camels. He says, I love camels, must be an Arab. So immediately he signs up and he says camels. So he's given a pregnant she camel. And the angel says, May Allah bless you in your wealth. And the angel leaves. And then he goes to the bald person. He's like, what is the wish of your heart? He's like, I want my hair returned to me. P 
people look at me, they make fun of me, they look down on me, I'm demeaned in society. I want Allah to return me my hair. So the angel once again rubs the head on the spot, the hair is stored, and then he asks him, what wealth is most precious to you? This person says cows. And once again, this person is given a pregnant cow, and may Allah bless you in your wealth. And finally, the person goes to the person who's blind. He says, what is the most beloved thing to your heart? He says that I want Allah to return my eyesight. So I can look at my family, I can look at people. And once again, his eyesight is returned to him. And he's asked, what is your favorite type of wealth? He says, goats and sheep. So he's given that. Narration goes on to say, the angel leaves. Years pass, months pass. And Allah blesses their wealth so much that each becomes a, a valley in and of itself. So the person with the camel has a valley full of camels. The person with the cow has a valley full of cows. And same thing with the person with goats and sheep. A valley full of those asses. Allah blessed them so much. Now just imagine how much you gotta have that an, an entire valley is filled up. And now the test begins. Allah sends the same angel back. This time the angel, once again, comes to the leper in the form of a, of a human being who has leprosy. So the angel comes. Years later, and the form that he has taken is that of a human who's a leper himself. And then the angel goes up to this person and he looks like a leper. And he says to this person, who once again owns a valley full of camels, whose skin has been cured. And he goes up to this person and he says, I'm a miskeen, I'm a poor person. I've been stranded. I was on a journey. I've been cut off from my caravan. I'm stranded. I have access to no wealth. I have no one to rely upon except Allah and then you. Can you just give me one camel so I can continue my journey? This man has a valley full of camels. And then in fact, the angel says, I ask you by the one who gave you your beautiful skin and this fair skin that you have and color that you have, that you give me one camel so I can continue my journey. You guys, the test, it's not even a difficult test, by the way. The test is so obvious. I mean, look at the hints that are being dropped. The angel comes in the form of a leper. And then he tells him, I ask you by the one who gave you your beautiful skin. And then one camel. When the person is asked that, you know what he says? He says, al kathira. In the modern lingo, a good translation would be, I got a lot of bills. Too many responsibilities. And he refuses to give one camel. And the angel now turns up the test up a notch. He says, I think I know you. Aren't you the person who used to be a leper? And you used to be poor. And then Allah gave you beautiful skin. And then he gave you a valley full of this wealth. Aren't you the same person? This person says, what are you talking about? This is generational wealth. Akabir an akabir. This runs in our family. What are you talking about that I'm a, I used to be poor and this and that? What are you talking about that I used to run a chai station in Pakistan? What are you talking about? I'm a self made man. I stand on the crutches of my own hard work. This is my talent. Forgets where he came from. In Urdu, we say, Aqad buljana. Completely forgotten. He's like, This is generational wealth. We're entitled to it. We made every penny of it. The angel says to him, in kunta kadiban fasayyarakallahu ila ma kunt. If you're a liar, I ask Allah to turn you back to what you were. And he's turned back into a leper. Same thing happens with a bald person. He asks him for one cow. I ask you by the one who gave you your hair and who enriched you. One, ca one cow. The person says, No, I got too many responsibilities. I got too much outflow of my, too many expenses. And this is my money, you got no right. Made the same dua against him. If you're a liar, may Allah turn you back into that. And finally, finally, he goes to the person who was blind. And subhanAllah, look at the spirituality of this person. As if he remained grateful to Allah over all these years. Maintain a gratitude practice. The moment he showed up in front of this person as a blind man. Now the angel comes as a blind person. He says, I've been cut off. I've been stranded. I ask you for one sheep, <coughs> one goat, so I can continue my journey. This person is moved, reminded of his own past. He says to him, I used to be blind too. 
and Allah gave me my eyesight back. I used to be poor, Allah enriched me. Take whatever you want. I will not argue with anything you take from me today. SubhanAllah. That's someone who remembered Allah. You know, it reminds me of Malcolm X. Remember, he used to be in prison. He used to be, as he describes, was he was a thug. Allah elevated him to a point that he was invited to Harvard University to be part of a panel. He said, I stood outside of the doors of Harvard. And I, I, he's like, I made a dua in my heart, Ya Allah, I will not be ungrateful to you as people are when they reach high spots in their lives. There's a Greek mythology which goes like this, that someone uh, was, uh, long story short, I forget the name of the figure, but his father attached wings to him, glued some wings on, and this person now started to fly in Greek mythology. And then he flew so high and became so high and mighty that started flying too close to the sun. And then the glue melted off and this person came crashing down. He's like, Ya Allah, I'll not be that arrogant person who flies too high for his own good. I'm grateful to you for what you have given me from what you, where you brought me. Yusuf al Islam, Ya Allah, where you brought me from the dungeons of the prison to now the minister of the finance minister of Egypt. This person, Ya Allah, I have not forgotten what you have done for me today. So the angel, when he heard this from him, he said, Allah is pleased with you and angry with your two companions. You guys, I like to end our uh, conversation today is how do we cure stinginess? Imam Ghazali says the reason people are stingy is for two reasons. One is because they got a long wish list of things. MashaAllah, Allah blessed them with a beamer. They got their eye on the Maserati. They're never content. The Tesla truck, you know, they have the Model S, but like, I gotta get the truck now. The list is endless, and therefore, they constantly need more and more money, and their attachment, attachment to money never goes down, no matter where they are in the income bracket. And number two, some people, especially when they get older, they develop this obsession with money, where they love money for the comfort it gives them. They just like it. Like money used to be, money is supposed to be a tool, not the end, but they just, they, this ishq that develops, for just holding money and the comfort it gives them, it just reduces their anxiety. So what do we do? Imam Ghazali says, learn to be content with little. And he says, you wanna reduce your wish list by reminding yourself of death. Attend the funerals of your colleagues, he says. He says, read the biography of people who are stingy, how the society views them, how their own family and friends view them. Read how the stepdaughter of Steve Jobs talks about Steve Jobs and the tight-fistedness that he showed her. And he says, use your intellect to loosen the grip of your desires on your heart. He's like, where is this wealth that you're hoarding going to end up? It's going to be devoured by your heirs. Why are you so attached? Why not spend your wealth in a way that's actually going to benefit you and that's after your death? Why hoard so much? And I'll end on this piece of poetry. One of the poets, he says, وَأَتَاكَ يُوسُفُ يَسْتَعِيرُكَ إِبْرَةً لِيَخِيْتَ قُدَّ قَمِيصِهِ لَمْ تَفْعَلِي It's so beautiful. I'll end on this. A poet, he's talking to his cheap cousin. He says, oh my cousin, you're so cheap. He says that imagine your home being filled with needles. Can you imagine the amount of needles it takes to fill an entire home? You're talking about hundreds and thousands, if not a million. You need that many needles to fill the entirety of one home. He's like, my cousin, you're so cheap. I want you to imagine that your home is filled with needles. Despite having all these needles, Yusuf Islam comes to you and he wants to borrow one needle so he can stitch the shirt that was torn. Reference to the story, if you know. He wants to borrow one needle to stitch the shirt that was torn off of him. You're that guy who would say no. He's like, Lam Tafali, you're not going to do it. Just like that guy, one camel. He's like, no, I got, I got bills to pay. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a people who are open-hearted, who are generous, who are willing to give, forthcoming. Subhanahu wa ta'ala.